Hi church, it's great to be online with you today. Trust you had a great week, but even if you didn't, that can change right now. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So whenever we gather together as believers and the word of God is preached, our faith is built. So no matter what this past week looked like for you, let's worship God together. And in doing so, we will soften our hearts to hear and receive God's word, which will build our faith. So let's worship. Church, we serve a mighty God. He rules and reigns over all things. With one voice, let's boldly declare His praises today. Let's go. Be the crown, be the light and sound. Be the fire burning inside us. confession today.
death and all chains defeated and the light we see
Church, we serve such a faithful God. He's done it before. He's healed you before. He's brought provision before. He's mended your relationships before. He's raised things from the grave before. And He can do it again. Let's sing this together with conviction, church. Walking around these walls Thought by now they fall, but you have never failed me. Waiting for change to come, knowing the battles won. For you have never. Jesus, 
Church, what a powerful reminder that God will never fail us when we put our hope and trust in Him. God knows the future and the plans He has for us, and we can always rely on Him because He is a consistent provider and source of strength. And His Word promises us this in Jeremiah 29 verse 11. It says the following, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. This is a well-known promise from God. And if you're facing a difficult situation today, we can take comfort in Jeremiah 29 verse 11, knowing that this is not a promise to immediately rescue us from hardship or to suffering, but rather a promise that God has a plan for our lives. And regardless of our current situation, He will work through it to prosper us and give us a hope and a future if we stay connected to Him. You may be going through a season of uncertainty at the moment where you're not sure how things are gonna work out. It could be that you're wanting to start a family and you've done everything possible in your strength, but you have had no success. Maybe you've been looking for a job and everything is hanging in the balance and there's a level of uncertainty for your future. Or maybe you've started a new business or you're wanting to, but the uncertainty of this pandemic has made you feel fearful. 
often we try our hardest to fix what we can in our own strength and we can feel overwhelmed. This can cause us to lose confidence in the future. But it's important to remember that God is with us. He wants us to prosper and to succeed, but we need His strength to get us through life's challenges, not our own. When we want to give up, remember, His plans are bigger than ours and we need to trust that God will provide for us because He promises us this in His Word. His Word says that He plans to give us a hope and a future. So if you're feeling discouraged today, we're going to pray in a moment for renewed strength as we trust in God. Come church, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. And today we pray for renewed strength for every person in every situation that is represented online today. Thank you that you never fail us. Thank you that your plans for us and our future are good. We pray today that we will keep our focus on you through times of uncertainty. And we thank you that we can rely on you for a better future because you will never fail us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, hi there, church. Thank you so much for joining us online again today. And it's great to have you in the service. And I just want to take an opportunity to also welcome all our first-time visitors. If you're tuning in for the very first time online today, a very, very warm welcome to you. Hope you enjoy the service. Hope you're blessed by it. And I'd love to just uh, direct you towards our website. There's some great information that you can access there. And it'll tell you all about who we are as a church and some of the great things that are part of church life. So make sure you go across to our website. Then I just also want to remind everyone that two weekends from now, on Saturday the 6th and Sunday the 7th of November, is our Miracle Offering Weekend. And this is really exciting. This is something we look forward to each year, where we take up our Miracle Offering which is something above our normal tithes and offerings. And it goes specifically to building with, to expanding our facilities on our campus. And uh, this year, we've got three things that we're going to be giving towards. Uh, one of them is the tarring of our two new car parks and uh, looking forward to having those completed fairly soon. We've also got a very big focus on the Rivers Foundation this year. We need to expand it and grow it in Durban. And so we're going to be purchasing another vehicle. We've got to... Um, uh, get more facilities as well in terms of office space and staff. So that's going to be a big focus. And then also, we're going to continue to trust God for another building. You know, before lockdown, we were looking at building a big 2,000-seater auditorium. Uh, things have changed a bit, but we still know that we need to expand and enlarge. And we, we're going to be looking for maybe a slightly smaller building, maybe an 800-seater or a 1,000-seater building where we can add more services. And uh, we're very much on the lookout for that. And that's a big focus for our miracle offering as well this year. And we'd certainly encourage you to participate. And then of course, ladies, this Friday is our very last sister's night for the year. And the wonderful news is that it's gonna be in person in the building at seven o'clock for all the ladies. And uh, you do need to book for this online via the Rivers app and bookings open on Tuesday at 8.30. We'd love to see you there, but let's have a look at a promo to see what's coming up in Sisters on Friday. Hey sisters, after an incredible online conference last month, we are so excited for our final sisters for the year, both online and in person coming up this Friday the 29th. Bookings for sisters in person open on Tuesday the 26th on the app and the website. Plus Kid Zone and Youth Guys Night will be running simultaneously. So make sure you book a place for your kids too. It's going to be an amazing night of worship, ministry and refreshing. So invite some girls in your world and let's celebrate our last sisters of 2021 together. Hi there church. I trust you're doing well and that you've had a good week. And it's so great that you've tuned in today. You know, we are very grateful for online church during this time. But I'm also hoping that soon you will be able to come join us right here at church in person for our weekend services. In fact, ladies, as we've just seen, we've got our last sisters of the year coming up this Friday night. And we're so excited that we get to do it together in person in the building. So make sure you book a seat for yourself and some friends. Bring your kids to Kid Zone, and let's pack out the house to half capacity for this Friday night. Amen. Now, as it comes round to our time of giving, I want to share with you a funny little story about tithing that I came across. And it's about a man who had a horrible dream. 
He said, I dreamed that the Lord took my Sunday offering and multiplied it by 10, and this became my weekly income. In no time, I lost my flat screen TV, had to give up my new car, and couldn't make my house payment. After all, what can a fellow do on a hundred rand a week? Then the person who told this story said, what if the Lord took your offering, multiplied it by 10, and made that your weekly income? How much would you make? Now, I thought that was a pretty interesting way to think about our tithing. And then I think it's good for us to say, well, is my giving to God a true reflection of how good and generous He has been to me? And also, is the attitude with which I give a true reflection of how grateful I really am for His generosity and kindness towards me? You know, those are good questions to be asking ourselves. And in the Bible, we see King David and the people giving generously to God for the building of the temple. And then David says this to God, Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. O our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I, and who are my people, that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you, and we give you only what you first gave us. You know, King David acknowledged that he is only able to be generous in his giving because God has already been abundantly generous to him. And we also see from this that David gives out of a heart that is truly grateful for God's blessings. And church, as we bring our tithes and offerings today, it's a good reminder that We are sinners saved by grace. We are only here because of the immense grace and faithfulness of God. And so let's make sure that our giving is a reflection of how good God is to us and of how grateful we are to Him. You know, a few verses later, David says this, I know, my God, that you examine our hearts and rejoice when you find integrity there. You know I have done all this with good motives And I have watched your people offer their gifts willingly and joyously. And then the message paraphrase then words that verse like this. I know, dear God, that you care nothing for the surface. You want us, our true selves. And so I have given from the heart, honestly and happily. Amen, church. Let's make that true of our giving today as well. And let's give God our full tithes and offerings with grateful hearts for all He has done for us. Now, as we get ready to give, let's take a look at the various ways in which we can do so. Giving online is quick, easy and secure. Here's how. You can give straight through the Rivers app by selecting Give at the bottom of your screen, then selecting your campus and the amount that you'd like to give, and you'll be directed to SnapScan to complete your transaction. You can also give directly via SnapScan by scanning the code below. If you'd like to give by credit card, you can also do so by heading over to our website and selecting Give Online. Finally, to give by EFT, use the details below. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today with grateful hearts. Thank you that you have blessed us so abundantly, Lord, and thank you that we can just give back to you out of what you have already given to us. Thank you that as we give, your kingdom is moving forward. Your church is getting stronger and we are also investing into our own lives as well. Bless every giver today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, over the past few weeks, we have been sharing with you how our giving is making a difference in the lives of other people through the work of the Rivers Foundation. And today we'd like to show you something else that the foundation is involved in through your generous giving. Let's take a look. Did you know that since our inception in 2006, the Rivers Foundation has identified a number of individuals, families and institutions in desperate need. And through your giving, we have had the resources to rebuild and refurbish homes and buildings to bring hope and for a better future. In the early years, we were involved in exciting refurbishment projects of worthy institutions, including Etembeni Children's Home, the Sentin Police Station, Renbeck Home Affairs and Alexander Hospice with the young adult team. We rebuilt homes savaged by fire in Lanseria and Alex. We repainted and cleaned up many schools and creches around the Johannesburg area. 
In KZN, we were able to sow into the community by repainting the hall of the Durban's children's home. And because of your generosity, we were able to construct a brand new facility for the Molueni Kresh. Both of these projects have enabled us to improve standards of living and care for these beautiful children, positioning them for a better education and future. Here in Belito, the staff and volunteers had a great time refurbishing the library at Waterfall Combined School. We painted the walls, we provided rugs, bean bags, wall art, and of course, books. And then at Masakane Kresh, we did a refurbishment where we provided tables and chairs for almost 50 little people, as well as mattresses and bedding for their nap time. And of course, toys, arts and crafts, wall art, and lots of things to keep them engaged. But most importantly, we set up a feeding scheme so that every day those little ones have a breakfast and a healthy lunch to look forward to. And we can't wait to do more. One of our most memorable projects was the construction of a brand new house for Michael, a learner at St. Ansgar's Combined School in Lanseria. Having lost his mother at one week old, he had battled his whole life to find a place to belong. And it was our privilege to be able to build him a home of his very own. Having to live here has been my greatest pleasure. In this home, I will make sure that I look after it, I take care of it. It was built out of love, out of care, out of knowing, out of need. So really, I'm grateful to Rivers Foundation. May God keep on blessing, increasing them. It's just amazing of what they did. Just may God bless them for me. We would like to thank everyone that has come alongside Rivers Foundation to support families like Michael. Your generosity enables people to change their lives for better. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, as we come round to the Word today, I want to do a slightly different kind of message. Uh, I need to tell you up front, it's going to be very practical, but I believe it's an important message that may add years to your life and might also be a lifeline for some others today. Now, last week I did a message called, You Are What You Think. And today's message is titled, You Are What You Eat. Now, let me just say at the start that my goal today is very simple. It's to help people in an area that affects all of us, and that's our eating. And, and let me say, I'm 100% convinced that every person watching this service likes eating. I like eating. In fact, I love eating. And like most of you, I also have a propensity to eat the things that I shouldn't eat. And uh, can I get an amen from your lounge room there? Now, now, today I'm not here to judge or criticize what you eat or what you don't eat. Uh, the goal, as always with the Word, is to apply it to our lives so that we can live better and serve God more effectively. And, and I also believe that we can honor the Lord even with something as practical as our eating. Now, our youngest child, Abigail, she's just turned eight, and, and, and quite often she'll come to me and say, Dad, wouldn't it be great if the things that were unhealthy for us were actually healthy, like chocolates, and the things that were healthy for us if they were actually unhealthy, like vegetables? And uh, you know what? I have to be honest and confess that every time she says that, the only truthful answer I can give her is, yes, my girl, it would be amazing because then we could have chocolate and ice cream and sweets whenever we wanted to, and they'd make us healthier. Now, the Apostle Paul was faced uh, with a similar dilemma, and although he wasn't necessarily referring to eating, uh, this is something we can all relate to. In Romans 7, verse 18, Paul says, I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And maybe if we had to apply that verse in the context of what we eat, you know, we could perhaps read it like this. I want to eat what is right, but I can't. I want to eat what is healthy, but I don't. I don't want to eat what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Now, of course, there's no 100% guarantee that if you eat right, that you will live longer and that your body, you know, will be free of illness, uh, just like there's no guarantee with raising your children. You know, you can do everything right as parents and your kids can still mess up their lives. 
However, you do greatly increase the odds of your children turning out well then. And likewise, when we eat better and when we take good care of our bodies, we greatly increase the chances of living better and also living longer. And church, remember, our lives are always in the Lord's hands, but we still have a responsibility to look after the body that God has entrusted to us. Now, I think most would agree that, you know, COVID has not just affected people financially and, and in their work. COVID has had a major impact on people's eating habits. And a survey done by the American Psychological Association in February this year found that 42% of American adults had gained weight since the start of the pandemic with an average gain of 13 kilograms. Uh, worldwide, 36% of people gained weight during COVID of at least two and a half kilograms. And, and interestingly, women were 14% more likely to gain weight than men and 17% less likely to lose weight. Now, another major survey done in England by the public health department said that COVID lockdowns had disrupted people's daily routines and made it challenging for people to eat healthy and keep fit. And they identified snacking and comfort eating as the main contributor to those who did put on weight. Now, a guy called David Sawa, he's the director of the Center for Obesity Research at Temple University in Philadelphia. And he says, people's diets, activity levels, sleep habits, and daily routines have been turned upside down by the pandemic. The stress, isolation, and challenges of making life work over the past year have necessitated changes in our behavior. For those of us in the obesity field, the weight changes aren't surprising, but they are concerning. And then there was other research that showed that physical exercise levels dropped by about 32% during the COVID period, and nearly 70% of gym members haven't gone back to their gyms, and neither do they plan to do so anytime soon. Now, in the introduction to the book of 3 John in the New Testament, the disciple John writes to his friend Gaius, who was a leader in the church and also a man of faith. And John begins his letter by saying this. He says, Dear friend, I hope all is well with you and that you are as healthy in body as you are strong in spirit. Now, we don't know whether Gaius was unwell or, or maybe recovering from illness or, or maybe there was nothing wrong with him. But John's prayer for Gaius was for him to be as healthy in body as he is strong in his faith. And clearly from the position that Gaius held in the church, well, he was strong in the faith. You know, and John didn't say to him, Gaius, my friend, you know, as long as you're strong in the spirit, strong in the faith, strong in the word, that's all that matters. You know, don't worry too much about your health. That's just carnal and fleshly. Just focus on your faith. No, no, he doesn't say that. John appeals to Gaius to be as healthy in body as he is strong in the spirit. So what I want us to do today is look at some practical things to help us eat better so that we can live better. Because remember that all of us to some degree will always be what we eat. The first thing today is this, is let your eating habits honor God. Now, this isn't something to get legalistic about because the danger is that we can very easily make a religion out of food. You know, where we base our right standing with God on what we eat. And then we begin to force that onto others as well. And, and, and there's a lot of vegans and even some hardcore vegetarians who, who treat food like a religion. And they'll tell you that it's wrong and immoral to eat meat, but, you know, nowhere does the Bible say that. In fact, it does say that God has given us the plants and the animals for us to use as food. But we must be careful not to infer that our salvation is linked to what we eat or what we don't eat. Our salvation is only dependent on faith in Christ, not on what we eat. However, the Bible still says that we should honor God with what we eat. And we read in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, 
Paul writes and he says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, I personally don't believe there's anything wrong with, you know, having a nice big burger and chips or, a, you know, one of those fully loaded pizzas or even a saucy, boneless mutton bunny. The problem comes though when, when these are the things that we eat regularly and you can't live well if these are your staple diet. In fact, I think if you eat fast food or takeaways more than twice a week, you're probably heading towards trouble. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Now, the context of this verse has to do with sexual morality, but I do believe that it also applies to some degree to what we eat. And if our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, well, then each time we put something into our mouths, we must consider whether we're building this temple or whether we are breaking down this temple that is our body. You know, I think it's good to perhaps get into the habit of asking yourself two simple questions before you eat something. The first question is this, is this beneficial or detrimental to my body? You know, in other words, does this food have nutrients in it? Does it contain vitamins that will uh, help my body function? Or is it just a combination of sugar, fat, and, and refined carbs that's going to spike your sugar level and then also clog up your arteries a bit further? A woman by the name of Anne Wigmore was an author and health practitioner from the mid-1900s. And she said, the food you eat can either be the safest and most powerful form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. The second question to ask is this, is am I using this food as medicine to feel better? And I think this is one of the biggest reasons for binge eating and snacking. It's to meet an emotional deficiency because, listen, let's be honest, you know, when you've had a bad day or you're feeling stressed out or, or you're just exhausted, you know, it's amazing how a big slab of chocolate perks you up. And then we feel better for a moment until it lands. And then we feel, we, you know, we feel bad all over again. And then we've got a little bit of extra guilt added on. And remember, church, that God has entrusted these bodies to us. Let's make sure we steward them well and use them for his glory. Can you say amen to that? Secondly is this, is be disciplined with what you eat. Be disciplined with what you eat. Proverbs 13 verse 3 says, Whoever guards his mouth preserves his life. He who opens wide his lips comes to ruin. Now, this is of course true for the things we say or speak. Uh, if you exercise discipline when you want to vent your frustrations and, and give your opinions and say what you really think, if you can guard your mouth, you will save yourself much trouble in life. And I think just as importantly, if you guard your mouth with what goes into it, I think it can also save us a lot of trouble in life. You know, our two teenage boys, listen, they love eating. I mean, if if eating were a sport, they would eat for the A team. And those of you with teenagers know what I'm talking about. You know, fortunately for them, they still have very fast metabolisms and they're very active with sport. But, but I've often had to say to them, boys, just because that food is there, it doesn't mean you have to eat it. Or, or just because it tastes nice, it doesn't mean you have to have seconds or thirds or even a fourth helping. No, no, discipline is needed in every area of life and, and it's definitely something that is required when it comes to what we eat. Someone once said that uh, hunger is the first element of self-discipline. If you can control what you eat, you can control everything else. And I think that's very true because, you know, discipline has a knock-on effect on our lives. If you can be more disciplined with what goes into your mouth, you will be more disciplined with what comes out of your mouth. And I think you'll all be, uh, we'll also be more disciplined with, you know, things like praying and reading the word and, and getting exercise because all of these require discipline. 
And discipline is a characteristic that you will always find with successful people. The business author Jim Rohn once said that discipline is the foundation upon which all success is built. Lack of discipline inevitably leads to failure. Then thirdly is this, is know what you're eating. Know what you're eating. The Bible says in Hosea 4 verse 6, the Lord says, my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. Now, my mom is a, is a godly woman. She loves the Lord. She served him faithfully for years, but but she's also been sickly for as long as I can remember. You know, and I've often wondered how much of her aches and pains are related to what she eats. And, uh, you know, she'll often tell me that she eats well and she eats healthy. And uh, then she'll tell me what she made herself for lunch or for dinner. And I have to say to her, but mom, it's actually not as healthy as you think it is. But church, it's good to know what we're actually eating because, you know, Otherwise, you can wrongly believe that you're eating healthy when you're not. And let me just remind some of you today, chips are not vegetables. You say, but they're made from potatoes. Yeah, but that's not vegetables. And neither is chocolate dairy. Yeah, but, but the Cadbury's ad says that, that it's made from a glass and a half of milk. It is, but it's not dairy. Now, the Author Michael Pollan, he's an American author and journalist who's uh, written extensively on the impact of food on our bodies. And uh, he's got a book out called Food Rules and Eater's Manual. And he mentions a number of interesting rules for good eating. And, and I want to list nine of them for you, which I think you might found, find very helpful today. Uh, his first rule is simply this, eat food. Now, that sounds obvious, but, you know, so much of what goes into our mouth cannot actually be classified as food. I mean, it's highly processed stuff with, you know, chemicals and ingredients that no person would ever keep in their pantry. His second rule is this. Don't eat anything your grandmother wouldn't recognize as food. <laughs> That's good wisdom. Thirdly is this. Avoid foods that have sugar listed among the top three ingredients. Fourthly, is avoid food products that contain more than five ingredients. You know, obviously, the more ingredients something has, the more processed it is. Fifthly is this, avoid food products that make health claims. You know, I think a great example of this is, is margarine. You know, margarine is not butter, and it's not healthy for you. In fact, it's nothing like butter. It's a lot cheaper than butter, but it's highly processed. And, uh, you know, like a used car salesman, the more he tells you that you need to buy this car, I think the more you should stay away from it. And, and it's often the same with products that make health claims. Then he says, number six, this one, avoid foods you see advertised on television. You know, I don't know if you've noticed that real food never has to be advertised on television. I mean, when last did you see a broccoli advert or a spinach advert? Number seven, he says, eat only foods that will eventually rot. In other words, natural foods, real foods, not something with a shelf life until Jesus comes back. Number eight, I like this. He says, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. And number nine, my favorite, he says, if it arrived through the window of your car, it's not food. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually find that quite helpful. I know it's very difficult to digest because we realize how much of what we eat, we probably shouldn't be eating. But church knowledge is important and it can help you be more discerning what you put in your body. Can you say amen to that? Wonderful. Number four is this. An unhealthy body prevents us living life to the full. You know, if you eat the wrong stuff, your body will never function properly. You will likely be overweight. You'll be unhealthy. You will most likely have to rely on medication. You will always be tired and probably battle with bouts of depression. You won't be able to play and run around with your kids. 
You'll be too tired to serve in church. You won't be at your best at work or in business because, listen, everything we put into our bodies has an effect on who we are and what we do. You know, if you put a dirty oil into your car engine, well, it will affect your car's performance. And if you keep putting dirty food into your body, it has to affect your performance in life. Now, a man by the name of Francis Bacon, it's a bit of an unfortunate surname, but Francis Bacon was an English statesman from the 1600s. And he said, a healthy body is a guest chamber for the soul. A sick body is a prison. You know, when you eat well, you feel better. You feel stronger. You've got more energy. You sleep better at night. And you don't need to rely on all sorts of pills and potions to give you a boost. There's a well-known ancient proverb that says, when diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When diet is correct, medicine is of no need. You know, and so often we, we pray for good health and, and we pray for healing from sickness and disease and, and all our aches and pains when what we actually need is to begin to change the way we eat. The ancient Roman poet Perseus wisely once said, you pray for good health and a body that will be strong in old age. Good, but your rich foods block the answer. You know, we often want divine healing. We want a miracle. We, we quote the scriptures. We ask the pastor to pray for healing for our sick bodies. But yet we keep feeding our bodies things that are destroying them. And, and if you're taking notes, which I hope you are today, here's a truth you can write down. The better we eat, the less healing we'll need. The better we eat, the less healing we'll need. You know, one of the biggest diseases connected to what we eat is diabetes. And interestingly, diabetes has recently become one of the top 10 causes of death in the Western world and has increased 70% since the year 2000. Diabetes is also responsible uh, for the largest increase in male deaths. And I know for a fact that many of you watching the service today have also been diagnosed as being diabetic. And you'd probably know that there are two types of diabetes. There's type one and there's type two. And, and type one is a chronic condition where the pancreas naturally doesn't produce enough insulin. And so it has to be controlled with insulin shots. But, but according to the Center for Disease Control, only about 5% of diabetics have type 1 diabetes. The rest of the people, that's between 90 to 95% of people have type 2 diabetes, which mostly occurs due to poor lifestyle and bad habit. And, and this type 2 diabetes can be properly managed and even reversed with a change of lifestyle by eating correctly, by losing weight, and through regular exercise. You know, eating the right things can often be very confusing because, listen, there's so many different diets out there. You know, some of them say, yeah, you need to cut all the carbs out. Others say, no, you need a high fat diet. You know, some say, don't have too much protein. Others say, you know, a bit of everything is good. But although they may disagree on some things, there's one thing that pretty much almost every diet, every doctor and every dietitian will agree on. And it's this number five is to reduce your sugar intake as much as possible. You know, Proverbs 25, 27 says it's not good to eat too much honey. Now, obviously, sugar was not around in Bible times the way it is now, but, but yet the Bible still warns us not to consume too much of what is sweet. And, you know, it doesn't say to avoid it completely, but it does say not too much. Now, I've got a bit of a theory about sugar. This is my own personal theory. Sugar's like sin. Why? Well, because we like it. It makes us feel good. And the more we have it, well, the more we want it. And the longer we consume it, the harder it is to give up. Can I get at least one amen there? You know, the problem with sugar, though, is that most people don't realize just how much sugar is in our food. 
You know, the good thing nowadays is, is that it's listed on the back of almost every item you buy. You know, it's just printed so small that you probably can't even read it. Or, or if we're honest, most of us don't actually want to know. But sugar in foods is a major contributor to weight gain. And uh, it also causes inflammation in the arteries, which leads to a whole lot of other serious diseases, things like diabetes, like cancer, like heart disease. And, and often what we think is healthy food is actually laced with sugar. And, and I just very quickly want to mention a few to you. Flavored yogurt, people think it's healthy. But you know, just 100 milliliters of flavored yogurt, that's those small little tubs that you give to the kids for school. Three teaspoons of sugar in it. You're far better off having plain yogurt. Or what about muesli cereal that we think is so healthy? 100 grams of muesli, just a small portion, has three teaspoons of sugar in it. And then people still add their own sugar on top of that. Or what about future life cereal? Everyone thinks it's so healthy, but it's like eating pudding because just 100 grams of future life has four teaspoons of sugar in it. You know, you're far better off having uh, something like cooked oats for breakfast. It'll fill you up for longer and there's almost no sugar in it. But then what about Coke? Now, I know most people know Coke's not healthy, but I think it's still the staple diet of so many homes. But I need you to listen now. A two-liter Coke has 54 teaspoons of sugar in it. 54. Now, I mean, think about it for a moment. Most people wouldn't scoop one teaspoon of sugar into their mouths like that. Yet we swallow gallons of it in fizzy drinks. But wait, people say, well, well what about orange juice? Because that's healthy, isn't it? So instead of drinking Coke, we drink big glasses of orange juice. But a two-liter bottle of orange juice has the equivalent of 44 teaspoons of sugar in it. You see, fruit, of course, has natural sugar, but, but remember that it takes about 30 oranges to produce enough juice for two liters. And there's no way you would ever eat 30 oranges as quick as you could drink two liters of orange juice. And by the way, that tiny little 100-gram slab of chocolate 13 teaspoons of sugar. But then people say, I oh, know that's right. We'll eat dark chocolate because that's healthier. Uh, not really. 12 teaspoons of sugar per 100 grams. There was an article on the Lose It online app that said, since the start of COVID, people have increased their sugar intake by 53%. Now, let me just confess, I love sweet things as much as anyone else. I love desserts. Ice cream is one of my all-time favorite things in life. I'm sure there will be ice cream in heaven one day. It'll just have no calories in it. You know, I can have a three-course meal with just desserts. I'm also one of those people who unfortunately can't just eat a small piece of chocolate and, you know, suck on it, and then you put the rest away in the cupboard. I'm like those devouring locusts the Bible speaks of that finish that thing in a matter of moments. And I know how hard it is to say no to sweet things. But you know, at the beginning of this year, I made a decision just to, just to stop sugar for a while. And I'll tell you what, it took my body three days to detox. I had migraine-like headaches that I haven't experienced before because my body was protesting. But I pushed through. And then I got to the end of January and I've just kept going. And you know what I've realized? I don't need it as much as I want it. And of course, you know, my kids keep asking me, Dad, when are you going to have sugar again? And they try to shove some of the stuff into my mouth. And I'm like, no, no, I don't know when I'm going to have it again, but I'm good for now. Nine months clean from sugar. Now I still have cravings, but far less than what I used to get. You see, church, I want to live well and I want to live long. I don't want to die before my time because of something that I could have avoided by making different and better eating and lifestyle choices. I want to see my grandchildren and their children and their children. Now, let me finish today by mentioning to you what, what, what I refer to as the Fab Four. You remember the Beatles, the, the music group? They were known as the Fab Four. Each of them were 
good musicians on their own, but when they worked together, well, they were amazing. And so they were given the name the Fab Four. But you see, I think there are also four things that, that if you do on their own, will all make a difference to your overall health. But if you can combine them, you will begin to see amazing results and improvements in your health. And these are them. Firstly, eat natural foods. Secondly, drink water. You know, get rid of the Coke and the juice and the fizzy stuff. Drink water. Thirdly, is to exercise 30 minutes a day, three to four times a week. And can I also just say, that has to be a bit more than just a gentle walk. A gentle walk is a basic bodily function. You have to exercise where you get your heart racing a bit so that your blood can begin to circulate better through your body. The former British Prime Minister Edward Stanley Smith said, those who do not find time for exercise will have to find time for illness. And then the fourth one is get more sunshine. Get outdoors more. Get more vitamin D into your body. Those four things, if you can do them a bit better and a bit more regularly, have the potential to change your life. Well, I hope that's encouraged you today and, and, and given you some food for thought. Let's honor the Lord with our lifestyle and the choices that we make. Can you say amen to that? Well, I want to pray for people in a moment to make the most important of all choices. And that's the choice to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You know, the Bible tells us that God loved the world so much that He gave His Son Jesus as an offering for our sin. And that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. God has made forgiveness available for anyone who comes to Jesus with a repentant heart. The Bible tells us we've all sinned against God and and sin always separates us from the Lord. But Jesus came as the mediator between God and man. And whoever puts their full trust in Him will receive grace and mercy and the forgiveness of their sins. Let's pray together, church. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that you have a good future for my life. And today, Lord, I I invite Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you that His blood was shed to wash me clean from my sin. Today I surrender to you in full. I embrace your salvation. Thank you for your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. I choose to live for you and for the glory of God and to honor you in all that I do. Thank you that when I make this decision, I'm born again through the power of the Holy Spirit. I commit my future to you and I surrender to you in full. I pray this in Jesus' name. And all those who prayed that prayer said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you didn't make that decision, I want to congratulate you. It's the most important decision you can make this side of eternity. And I'd love to also direct you to our website. We've got some a great information available to you there to help you walk out your journey of faith. And if you WhatsApp the number on screen right now, we can also be in touch with you. And if you leave your details, our team will be sure to follow up with you during the course of the week. Well, it's been a great uh, day online again. Remember, you are what you eat. And uh, ladies, just a reminder that this Friday is our last sisters in-person night for the year. It's going to be a fantastic night with uh, Yannette and the team. And uh, make sure that you do book on the app. Bookings are essential. And uh, they open on Tuesday at 8.30 a.m. for sisters. And then on Wednesday, 8.30 a.m. for the rest of the weekend. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Look forward to seeing you next week.